Hey everyone, we're doing a stream recap for the Ryzen 3 3100. We just did uh, about a three hour, 20 minute live stream on it. It was a lot of fun. I'm shocked at how smoothly it went. Normally this kind of stuff, it doesn't go quite as smoothly as this did. We only had maybe like a 30 minute period of really just stuck rebooting. But up until that point for the first hour, it was smooth sailing all the way up to five gigahertz. And we went past that too. And the voltage was far lower than I expected on the 3100. So. Uh, despite being kind of a boring chip and that it's not a, an expensive one, it was one of the most fun that I had to work on so far for an XOC. Before that, this video is brought to you by CD Projekt Red and the Cyberpunk 2077 PC modding contest. The Cyberpunk 2077 team is hosting a case modding contest that gives winners the opportunity to work with professional case modders to build the ultimate system. You don't have to do any physical modding to enter the contest, just a mock-up with three views of the mod. The theme is the future is recyclable, and it should be inspired by Cyberpunk, which has countless sources of influence for the work. The contest ends on May 17th, and Cyberpunk's team will select five winners to partner with pro case modders to make it a reality. Use any tools you want to make the mock-up of a Cyberpunk-themed build featuring e-waste or recycled materials, and then submit images to the team. Learn more and enter the contest using the link in the description below, or go to cyberpunk.net slash cyberup. So to recap things, first of all, let's get all the scores out of the way, just because everyone's going to ask about that. Uh, we obviously have the choice of the 3300X. Yes, it's a 4 plus 0 config instead of 2 plus 2. We talked about that in our comparison video, but I wanted to use the 3100 just because, because I thought it'd be fun and it's the cheapest one, it's 100 bucks. So the question is, something that should be, other than the Athlon, the worst bin silicon, how high does that still go? So that's what we did. We used Cinebench R15 and R20 for quick benchmarks, not 3D stuff for this. So just R15, R20, and clocked it as high as it would go. I've got some numbers, we can put a, a table of some kind on the screen for you for the recap, but stock, full stock, no XMP or anything, it was about 1,008 points for uh, R15 and R20, it was about 2305 for 4.4 gigahertz at about 1.4 volts and running only minus seven degrees for the pot temperature. It was about 1113 or so for R15, and we did test that again at a, a lower temperature of minus 40. It was about the same score for that. We then ran a 4.6 gigahertz all core at minus 42 degrees, 1.4 volts, so 1.394 get, and that was an 1187 score. Saw scaling all the way down, I'll skip a couple of these numbers, but 4.7, no problem at 1.4 volts, 4.8, no problem. There was some regression of the score at 4.8 versus 4.7, and uh, that may have been an efficiency issue or something going on in the background, but we re-ran it a few times later and saw the scores increase. Ended up at minus 100 degrees, so not even that cold for LN2, at five gigahertz, and 1.4 volts still, 1278 for R15, and then 3,013 points for R20. So that's the point where up to before the stream, when I was doing stream prep, I had tested up to about 5.2, but it was using uh, one, a shorter test, so I didn't know if it would be stable enough for R15. Uh, we were trying to really rapidly do it. And then two, that was at 1.55 volts. So to see 5.0 at 1.4 volts set uh, with LLC mode three, so it's about 1.394. That was really not expected. Really good efficiency on the CPU overall. Score was scaling. And then uh, we ended up with getting all the way down to the bottom of uh, whatever chart I end up making. At minus 180 degrees, that seemed to be what was required to get the 5450 to hold. So 5450 did hold for one test, and then it crashed right after that. But it made it, and it scored 1392. I didn't end up getting time to run R20 because bench died, and I didn't want to fight it because uh, to get, bring it back up from minus 180 takes forever. I'd have to stick a torch in there for like five minutes to heat it up. So yeah, 5450 megahertz was our end. That was 1.55 volts, also lower than I would expect necessary. And score was 1392, so it's still scaled. So yeah, I'm blown away at how good the 3100 was. I was really not expecting that out of a $100 CPU. Uh, so what was really needed to get past 5350 to 5450, that extra 100 megahertz did not come easily. I had to bring the temperature down from minus 152 to about minus 180, and then it made it. Only at that point did it make it through. But the problem was, as soon as the power load from Cinebench ended, CPU's not doing anything anymore, so now there's no heat to really uh, burn out that liquid nitrogen. And what ended up happening was the temperature plunged on the LN2 pot. It went down to like minus 190 something. 
which is about the floor for liquid nitrogen, and we lost stability and it crashed. So if I really wanted to do it properly, I'd probably have to run that again and shove a torch in there and heat it up as soon as the test is ending to prevent it from freaking out and shutting down. Uh, turning off proc hot, as recommended by a chat, a chat went a little bit crazy towards the like two hours, 30 minute mark, and it's kept spamming, turn off proc hot, which turned into turn off hot pockets and then hot pockets with tater tots and then turn off crock pot. And I don't really understand what was happening in the chat at that point, but I took their advice and I turned off proc hot and uh, it did seem to help with some of the weird bugginess we were getting. So uh, we used Ryzen Master for this. I do not like the software, but it was the best thing I had available on short notice. One of our viewers, Evocati Productions, was kind enough to send me over some better software. It's the Asus version. So we'll try that next time, and I hope to see some better success. Ryzen Master stops at 1.55, as far as I know anyway, with the version we have. Uh, so I was not able to push higher voltage than that. And hardware numbers jumped in as well and recommended some PLL settings. We'll play around with that next time we do this too. Uh, Derbaro was in there asking me to use his thermal paste, and I said, send me some. And then he sent us 100 euros and told us to buy some. So that's what you missed out on if you didn't see the stream. Uh, it was a lot of fun, though. I guess takeaways here. At 1392 points for 5450 megahertz, 5.45 gigahertz, that puts us pretty close to a 1600 AF at 4.2 gigahertz. So the, I mean, this is a Cinebench like tile-based test, right? We don't even use this in our reviews because we don't really like it. But it'd be similar. It'd be an analog to Blender. So this is not representative of gaming performance. You have to tank Infinity Fabric to get this really running to about 1467 megahertz. Might be able to do a little higher. And that will have an impact on gaming performance. If you're really willing to sit down and do the work, you could, in theory, uh, get some good memory and really drive down the timings, drive out the frequency, min-max as much as you can. You'd probably make up the delta and end up with a higher frequency in gaming that's actually providing value, as opposed to just dropping Infinity Fabric for a higher frequency where you're going to end up with worse gaming performance despite a 5 point something gigahertz core frequency because you've made everything else worse. That's why we use Cinebench for it, because it's easy to show scaling with just an all core. Uh, so there's more we can do if we wanted to get gaming results. But you know, it's not really a direct comparable thing, but just for fun, I guess, uh, it shows you how good the 1600 AF was at $85 when it was that price, which is not the case normally anymore. So that was 1442.6 at a uh, 4.2 gigahertz. And then another comparison, we had an 8086K stock at 1418 megahertz, or sorry, 1418 Cinebench uh, R15 NT points, and 8700K stock about uh, about the same, obviously. So that's where you, where you, I guess, if you ran it on LN2 at these settings, you could find it. But really good performance overall. We switched this knock to a Redux fan to get something a little bit quieter. It worked okay. I had it on the table like this to blow the uh, the vapor this way to get it away from the memory and away from the board as much as possible. It seems to work OK. The LN2 pot is still completely coated in snow. We probably stopped pouring LN2. Like, we stopped the stream maybe 15 minutes ago, stopped pouring LN2 probably 20, 30 minutes ago. So this thing is still at minus 54 degrees Celsius. Um, this is the Derbauer Beast pot. We've lapped the bottom of this. We worked with Joe on that. I did the setup during the stream where I applied a flat layer of KPX paste on the bottom of it, so manual spread for that. And we've got direct contact with a lapped LN2 pot. You really can't get much better than this one. This is like uh, when I was pouring, even with only a 70 watt heat load on this CPU, it was still evaporating instantly. So really good, um, I guess, contact with this one. The mount is super good on this. And all I did was sit it on top of it. So yeah, everything worked really well this time. It's Amazing how smoothly it went. The board's an X570 godlike. I coated it with Vaseline, especially behind the socket. It builds up a lot of ice on there. And there's actually still a bunch of frost down there, even though it's only minus 50 now. I guess that's still, that makes sense. That's still below the freezing point. But uh, there's a lot of frost down there. So yeah, that, that was the trick to keeping it running. Couple things I'd like to change the next time. I've learned from, learned, obviously I'm not like a pro seer. We do this once every month or every couple months, uh, recently anyway. So I don't get to do this a lot. I have a lot to learn. And things I've learned recently would be uh, playing around with PLL. In the middle of the stream, I was reminded by hardware numbers, this is something I learned but I'd forgotten, to increase SOC voltage. So I put that up to 1.4. He was saying do 1.5, but 1.4 seemed to work what we were holding at the time. 
Don't do that, by the way, for like daily use. Do not do that. That's just for LNTOC. Uh, and then also, Proc Hot was a setting I was not even familiar with on AMD CPUs, so that was good to learn. And then next time, I guess things to try would be better software, uh, try the PLL settings, and see what happens from there. So that's our takeaways. Always happy to learn some stuff from the audience, and especially the uh, the real overclockers who jump in, like Roman, Joe, was in their bearded hardware. Hardware numbers, those guys. So a lot of good information from them, and really good scoring. Uh, yeah, 3100s a chip you shouldn't buy. You should get the 3300X instead. But I guess if you wanted something cheap to play around with for Allen too, I don't know if the thermal density helps. Like having two CCXs, maybe there's some better stability at higher frequencies there instead of one. But you're still not going to make up that latency hit. And maybe in this scenario, but to what end is the I guess the point there. Oh, power numbers I should give too. Uh, I thought at first when I took a current reading, I thought that the number was wrong. And in the stream, I, I opened up like hardware info just to see. It's, I don't really rely on it, but it gets you close enough. And it was in fact correct. So direct power to the EPS 12 volt cables was about 70 watts at 1.4 volts, which we were holding 5 gigahertz at, at minus 100 degrees. Really good settings. Stupid low power. Uh, I don't know really. That's like. It's lower than what we saw at the 1.368, 4.4 gigahertz set we had for the review, but the temperature is so damn low that I think we drove down the power leakage to a point where it was, it was that, 86 watts for 1.55, uh, and that was with I guess another factor too was um, at the point of this measurement, the V dim was only like 1.2 instead of 1.35 or 1.45 or whatever it was for our review for the OC. So that contributes, and then uh, SOC was all over the place depending on what we were doing. So that's it for the stream recap. A lot of fun. Thanks for watching. Thanks to all of you who contributed uh, financially with Super Chats or by buying stuff on the store. That's what makes the streams possible, and uh, we very much appreciate it. So yeah, I guess stay tuned for the next content. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly, and make sure you keep an eye out for more streams. We're going to be doing more of them, especially with the 10 series coming up. I'll see you all next time.